you've known me any length of time, you know that Jeremiah is my book. I love the book of Jeremiah. Uh, you know, if, if you can see the fly leaf of my Bible and see how it's marked up, every page in Jeremiah is just about that way. Um, I love Jeremiah so much because much of what was going on in his day is going on in our day. Jeremiah was faithful to preach the word of God for 40 years and we have no biblical account of any converts. I've heard preachers say that you know if you're not growing your church and you're not doing this, you're not doing that, you're not successful. Well, what do you do with Jeremiah? In the end, God said he was ultimately successful because he did exactly what God told him to do. You see, fruits of the Lord. Where to plant, where to water, God's the one who gives the increase. And uh, except the Lord build a house, they that labor, labor in vain. I know a lot of preachers that's got converts. I'd rather the Lord have converts. Are you listening? Uh, but in Jeremiah's day, it was a wicked day. God's chosen people, the Israelites, had turned their back on God. And Brother Bob, if that wasn't bad enough, then they took it a step farther. They started worshiping Baal. They were worshiping the devil. And it got so bad, Brother Mike, that they were actually taking their children and sacrificing their children to the god Molech. They were burning their children at the stake to a false god. God raised up a prophet named Jeremiah to preach against this uncircumcised of heart, stiff-necked people, and told them basically to repent or perish. And they refused to hear the man of God. In chapter 6, he said, Stand ye in the paths and ask for the old paths. That's the good way. Walk therein. They said, We will not walk therein. He preached and he preached and he preached. And he starts out chapter number 9, he says, Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. He saw their wickedness. He saw all that was going on. He knew the message from God. He knew judgment was coming. Jeremiah actually saw that judgment come to Israel, where Israel was destroyed, the city of Jerusalem was broken down, the temple was destroyed, and they were carried off into captivity into Babylon, all because they refused to repent. Now that I've set the stage with how terrible it was there, can I say, America is just a shadow of what she once was. Do you know that America was founded upon the principles and oracles of the Word of God? Now, there's a lot of things in America's history that I'm not particularly proud of. I'm glad I'm an American. I still believe it's the best country on the face of the earth. But there's a lot of wickedness going on in America, and especially in Washington, D.C. But you don't have to go to Washington. You can go to Frankfurt. But you don't even have to go to Frankfurt. You can go to Florence and find a lot of wickedness going on in America. America has turned their back on God. Used to, uh, the Bible was taught in school. Used to, in my lifetime, I remember starting my day in public school, we say the Pledge of Allegiance and have prayer. Both which are very unpopular today because the Pledge of Allegiance is under God. Mm. We're living in a day and age where we've let a lot of progressive liberal college professors teach people away from the very thought and concept of God Americans believe they control their own destiny. Benjamin Franklin said, If a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without God knowing it, and how can a nation be born without God's hand upon it? Can I say, America's forgot our founding fathers. They forgot what they stood for. George Washington, the one that we wanted to make king, and he said, No, we'll not have a king rule in America. We'll have a democracy. George Washington said that America is founded on Christian principles and is a Christian nation. America was never founded to let all the Asian and Eastern religions come to it. America was founded to worship God. Did you ever wonder why Mexico has always struggled and been a third world country? Because they came to Mexico seeking gold. 
They came to America seeking God. But America is wicked. America, do you realize we pay farmers not to grow food in America where we could, in, through America, feed the world? Do you realize that there is no need for anybody being homeless in America? Do you realize of all nations, America should not have any racial divide? We all came from somewhere else unless you're Native American. But yet, we have politicians, we have news media playing up the racial divide, trying to divide our nation. You know what will unite our nation? The blood of Jesus Christ. Hmm? Absolutely, preacher. But America has fallen so far from where she once stood. America that used to lead the world in industry, lead the world in education, lead the world in every facet of life. America has become like Israel which became like Sodom, which became wicked in the sight of God. Now that we said all that, I want to give you two positive verses out of chapter number 9. Look with me, if you will, in verse 23. The Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we bless your holy name. Lord, we have so thoroughly enjoyed the service. Our hearts have been touched and impacted greatly. God, thank you for the good testimonies, the folks bragging on the Lord and what you've done for them, how you've heard and answered prayer, and how you've blessed and how you've strengthened and how, God, you've met needs. And God, we thank you for the good singing. Lord, our hearts have been touched, and the singing certainly has set the table for the preaching. God, I'm thankful I've been to Calvary. Lord, I'm thankful I've been washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I'm certainly thankful that I live in America, even though she's not what she once was. Lord, I'm thankful we still have the liberty to worship. Lord, we still have the liberty to go and tell others about Jesus. Lord, we're thankful for your good grace and your tender mercy. Now, Father, I pray you'd help us from the Word of God tonight. Lord, I certainly pray you'd bless those working with the children and bless those working with the teens. God, send revival in these days. We know the only hope from America won't come from Washington, won't come from the capital here in Frankfurt. Lord, our hope will come from the Lord. And Lord, we're looking unto you, the author and finisher of our faith, and trusting in you to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Father, get glory to your name. We'll bless you for it, for it's in the holy name of Jesus we ask these things. Amen. Amen. I want you to notice three things about these verses, and we'll get to the, to the message. I want you to notice, first of all, the instruction. In verse 23, the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord. Now, when the Lord speaks, we better pay attention. Thus saith the Lord... Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him glorieth, and him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. The instruction from the Lord is, uh, quit looking around and look up. Hmm. He's instructing them in the midst of their wickedness, uh, in the midst of their turning their back on him. Uh, he says, hey! You need to glory in this one thing, that you know me. Now notice, if you will, the index of this verse 23. He breaks down the whole nation of Israel in three categories. He says in verse number 23, uh, he says, uh, 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 let him that uh, uh, Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, 
the mighty man in his might and the rich man in his riches. Uh, he says, uh, 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 let uh, 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 each and every one of these categories understand something. And he puts them in three different categories. He puts them in uh, uh, those that are uh, 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 glowing in their wisdom, uh, those that are glowing in their might, uh, and those that are glowing in their riches. Uh, uh, friend, uh, you better be careful leaning on your understanding. Uh, you better be careful leaning on secular understanding. Uh, you better be careful uh, 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 leaning on things that make sense to you. Uh, you better not glory in what uh, faculties you have in your mindset. Uh, you better not glory in what you've come to understand and know. Uh, you better not glory in your education. Uh, you better glory in Him, my dear friends. Uh, by the way, who do you think gave you the mind that you've got anyway? But then he says, him that glories in his might, you better uh, be real careful glorying in your strength. One thing that I've learned being 58 years old, I'm not as strong as I used to be. Mm -hmm. And I go to church with a bunch of smart alecks. One sitting right there. I said, preacher, I like your car. How do you get in it? And I was quick to remind her that I wasn't the one that fell last week and got all bruised up and come to church. So I may be old, but I'm not as old as you. You're right, I am. But one thing's for certain, the older we get, Uncle Arthur seems to show up more. Uh, arthritis. Now, you're not getting old. I know every year you tell me you stay at 39, huh? Um, but you better be careful glorying in your strength. It, it only takes somebody running a stop sign and all your strength to be gone. And by the way, who do you think gives you the strength to get out of bed in the morning anyway? Hmm? Uh, oh, I, in my mind, I'm still 15. I get to run around out here with these kids and I find out real quick I'm not there anymore. Matter of fact, just going up and down steps every now and then is with feet, you know? He says, him that glories in his might, don't you better not glory in your might. Don't let the mighty not glory in your might. And he deals with those glorying in their riches. You better be careful boasting and glorying in how much you got in your pocket. Hmm? I don't know if you paid attention in the last few months. This week, gasoline went from two ninety four to three twenty five. Uh, I, I don't know if you paid any attention. Uh, 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 this time last year, you could buy a gallon of milk for dollar seventy nine. We was just at the grocery uh, Friday. It's two sixty nine. Caitlin, do something about that. Uh, go and talk to Mr. Kroger and tell him put it back where it was. Uh, and how come you used to get a box of spaghetti this big for ninety nine cents? Uh, now you get one this big for four dollars. What's the deal, huh? It's all, the prices are going up. It's going up much quicker than your wages are. It's called inflation. Hmm? How's them 401ks looking this year? Yeah, where's the shouting on that? It doesn't take long for everything you've worked a lifetime for to be gone. And by the way, who do you think gave you what uh, change you got in your pocket? Who do you think gives you the ability to put gas in your gas tank? Uh, who do you think provides for everything that you have? Uh, it all comes from the hand of the Lord. Uh, so he gives instruction. We see the index, but notice the illumination in verse 24. He simply just makes it real plain. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. The illumination is very simply, mm, you better put your trust and faith in me. I'm the one who provides, and I'm the one who saves and redeems. I want to preach really what he closes verse 24 with. He says, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Now I want to preach with God's help just a few minutes on this thought. What does the Lord delight in? I mean, if he delights in it, I want to certainly incorporate it in my life. I want to be where God's pleased, don't you? 
Uh, listen, I don't want to upset anybody. I really don't. I don't want to make you mad. I don't want to make you angry. But there's one I guarantee you I don't want to upset at me, and that's the Lord. I want to certainly be in His good graces, and I want to know what He delights in. And so let me give you a few things tonight that the Lord delights in. Can I say, first of all, He delights in His own orderly exercise. He gives it to us in verse 24. Things in himself that he delights in. Can I say, what are they, preacher? Well, first of all, he says, uh, I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness. Can I say, he starts out with that he is a merciful God. He is a long-suffering God, and he delights in loving kindness. Uh, that means he is a God who is kind and a God who is loving. Uh, and he puts it together and makes it extra sweet uh, that he's a God of loving kindness. Uh, do you realize if he gave us what we deserved, we'd all be in hell tonight? Uh, you know why we're not in hell tonight? Because he is a God of mercy, uh, and he is a God full of loving kindness. Uh, he winked at our ignorance. Uh, he, uh, Brother Bob could have came... Uh, 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 before you got saved uh, he could have took you out before you got saved as a lost church member uh, but in his loving kindness uh, he said I'll just let him keep coming to church uh, I'll keep wooing him uh, I'll keep dealing with him uh, and that night when he was ready you was ready and you got in what a blessing uh, because of the loving kindness of God how many have heard this boy if I'd have known being saved was so great I got saved sooner you know why you didn't get saved sooner you wasn't ready you were still trusting in you and your strength and your riches and your wisdom. Uh, but the Lord in His loving kindness just kept uh, uh, wooing you, just kept putting people in your way, uh, just kept putting the Word of God in your way, uh, just kept dealing with you, just put people in your life. Uh, and what a blessing. Uh, he brought you to the place where you trust in Him. Uh, hey, he delights in loving kindness. Aren't you glad He's that kind of God? Now, the world don't portray him that way, but they don't know him. Uh, but he not only says he's a God of long-suffering, of loving-kindness, but he's a God of judgment. Now, I hate to call names, but no, I don't. By the way, Paul wrote that we're to mark them and avoid them, those that speak contrary to truth. And there's a lot of TV preachers and a lot of radio preachers uh, that are more interested in lining their pockets with your offerings than they are in telling you the truth. And a lot of them, all they'll tell you is that He's a God of love. Well, duh, First John chapter 4 tells us God is love. But He's not only a God of love, He's also a God of judgment. You see, God in His loving kindness gives you opportunity after opportunity. He gives mankind opportunity. He deals with mankind with their sin. And He constantly is speaking because He came seeking to save that which was lost. But there comes a point when you'll reject Him for the last time. And can I say, God is angry with the wicked every day. He loves the sinner, but He hates sin. And He's going to judge sin and just like Israel was, by the way, they're still His chosen people. You better be careful what you say about the Jews. He, his promise to Abraham is still in effect. He blessed them that blessed them and cursed them that cursed them. Uh, and so I want to bless uh, uh, the nation of Israel. And I pray for Israel. And I pray for the peace of Israel. Uh, uh, but I'm glad uh, even though Israel was the true vine, uh, God grafted in a branch uh, uh, called the church. Uh, and He made a way where old Gentile dogs uh, uh, had no right to the promises of Abraham. Uh, through the blood of Christ, uh, uh, we become the children of Almighty God. Uh, but can I say, God is going to judge sin. He still says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. You know why we're to evangelize you? You know why we're to tell folks about the Lord Jesus? Uh, because if they don't get saved, they're going to face the wrath of God. And God delights in judgment. He doesn't delight in damnation, but He delights in defending His name. He's a God of judgment. He's a God of loving kindness. But He's also a God of righteousness. He delights in righteousness. He delights 
in things that are holy. He delights in his people striving to live right in a wicked world. So God delights in his own orderly exercise. But God delights in some things in us. Now, we mention it around here a lot. Who are we that God would care about us? That God would die for us? That God would allow us to be saved? That God would walk through our services and bless us and help us? Uh, Who are we that God would do that for? Uh, But can I say, there are things that God does delight in in us. We are His creation. You do realize that God created everything to bring glory to God. You know, a tree grows straight up. You know why? Because it's pointing to God. Uh, You know, when birds sing, they're singing praise unto God. That's what God created them to do. You know, when a a, a coyote howls at the moon, he's honoring God. That's what he's doing. That's what he's created to do. Everything in nature, when it does what God created it to do, brings honor and glory to God. Do you know God created man for one reason? To bring glory to God. But when man fell to sin, man dishonored God. So when you and I actually bring glory to God, he delights in that we're doing what we were created to do. Well, let me give you a few things that we can do that He delights in. Can I say, first of all, He delights in obedience. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, and verse 22, the Bible says, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. Uh, Can I say, when you sacrifice, uh, when you offer things to God, uh, uh, they they may be in order and they may be uh, 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 what God would expect from you, but He'd rather have an obedient heart uh, than your offerings and your sacrifice. What can we offer God, really? Uh, I mean, He owns everything. Uh, He threw the stars out there on nothing and called them by name. Uh, He tells the sun to shine every day. Uh, He created sunsets. Uh, He created rainbows. Uh, He put every drop of water in the ocean. Uh, Hey, uh, God made everything that's made. Uh, He's made the galaxies upon galaxies. What could we do to impress God? Absolutely nothing. But you know what He delights in? When we obey His voice. When it says, Thus saith the Lord, and we click our heels and stand to attention and say, Yes, Lord. And we do what the Lord says. He delights in that. He delights in obedience. Huh? If He delights in obedience, that must mean He must frown on disobedience. Hmm? Can I say this secondly? He delights in openness or honesty. The Bible says in Proverbs 11, 1, A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is His delight. He's dealing with weights and measures. He's dealing with, in those days, uh, uh, they would have a a weight that was off a little bit uh, so they could skim a little bit more from people. uh, And he thought, uh, uh, well, I can pull one over on somebody. uh, I'll put this weight on here. It actually weighs more than it's supposed to. uh, And I'll get more money for this and this barter and this exchange. Uh, uh, God is against that. Uh, God wants your yeas to be yea and your nay to be nay. Uh, uh, God is interested in us being open and honest and transparent. Uh, uh, And God, he delights in honesty. Huh? You know what this world doesn't like? Honesty. We don't like truth. We don't like to admit there are things in America that's broken. And the only way they're going to be fixed is if Almighty God steps in. Mm. We don't like to admit that. Because we want to beat our chest and think we can fix everything. And America's mindset to fix everything is just throw money at it. There are some things money can't buy. Joy, peace, Love. Are you listening? Uh, And those are fruits of the Spirit. Mm. God delights in openness. He delights in honesty. He delights in a conversation that says, we don't have the answer, we better seek the Lord for the answer. Mm. He delights when we're 
open and honest like some of you tonight uh, 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 standing and testifying uh, uh, that you need God and that God's helped you and that God's heard you. God honors that. He, he, he likes that. Uh, uh, when we humble ourselves and say, uh, not I, but Christ that liveth in me. Uh, when we humble ourselves and say, I need help. Uh, the devil's been on my back. Uh, uh, will you pray for me? God certainly likes and delights in openness and honesty. Can I say this? He also delights in the outstanding, mm -hmm. the upright, those that are above the rudiments of this world, those that don't get down in the gutter and act like the gutter rats of this world. Uh, I'm thinking of Job, a man that loved God, feared God, and he eschewed evil. He was upright. He was of the outstanding crowd, huh? Uh, I believe as Miss Lisa said, uh, uh, she used to be part of the popular crowd. Well, we ought to all aspire to be part of the outstanding crowd. Mm? The crowd that lives better than uh, uh, the average Joe. And not that we are better than the average Joe. Well, we're not worth the powder take uh, to blow away. But because of what Jesus has done in our life, uh, we ought to aspire to live as clean uh, and as great as we can for His honor and for His glory. Let me give you the verse, uh, Proverbs eleven twenty one or eleven twenty. They that are of a forward heart are an abomination to the Lord, but such as are upright in their way are His delight. Hmm? We, ought to, we ought to live to be upright. Hmm? Just strive to be clean, pure, and do right, huh? And do right by others. Hmm? You know they used to teach the golden rule in school. Do unto others as you'd have others do unto you. Are you listening? We don't, we don't, we don't teach that much even more in church. Uh, we think we ought to take advantage of everybody. That's not being upright. Mm. Upright says this, if a man compels thee to go with him a mile, go with him twain. Go the extra mile for people. That's being upright. Huh? God delights in that. Let me give you a few more. We'll be done. Can I say this? God delights in those that are on the up and up. Mm -mm. They're sincere. Mm -mm. Proverbs 12, 20 said, Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are His delight. The ones on the up and up, sincere. Just deal with folks the way that God would. You know, Charles Sheldon wrote a book in the late 1800s called In His Steps. A few years ago, the charismatic crowd jumped on it, and they bastardized it, and they changed the name, they made a movement of it. Uh, but the concept of the book is still great. What they changed it to is, what would Jesus do? And the book deals with a town where a few folks in town made up their mind, and they made a commitment one to another, that for a solid year, every decision they made, they'd stop and think, what would Jesus do in this situation? And they made up their mind, they would do what Jesus would do. And by the end of the year, Miss Mary, that whole town had been turned over to Jesus. The whole town was doing what Jesus would do. Uh, because just a few made up their mind. They'd just do what Jesus would do. How great would our world be if everybody just stopped and said, well, what would Jesus do in this situation? And if you don't know, get down on your knees and pray and get in the Bible and find out what he'd do about it. Uh, you know what? Our world would be a whole lot better if we did what Jesus would do. See, God delights in those that are sincerely seeking to do as he would do. Hmm? Can I say this? God delights in the offering of prayer. Hmm? I should have looked it up how many verses in the Bible... 773,000 words over 1,100 chapters, 66 books. How many verses deal with prayer? Hmm. See, prayer is how we talk to God, and He talks to us through His Word. And He delights in the offering of prayer. The Bible says this, in Proverbs 15, 8, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is His delight. See, when you talk to God and you're telling God you have to depend on Him for your very breath, and you tell God in your prayer how wonderful He is to you, 
and you tell God in your prayer how thankful you are to Him for His tender mercy and His grace in your life. And you tell God that you're seeking His wisdom for a situation in your life. And you depend on God to affect the hearts of those of your loved ones and friends and co-workers that don't know Him. And you ask God to deal with their hearts uh, and you ask God to save them. And you're depending on God for every facet of your life. God's pleased with that. He delights in that. The worst thing we can ever do as Christians is try to do it ourselves. Do it in the energy and the power of the flesh. That displeases God. But when we do it leaning on His understanding and trusting in Him and seeking Him, that, my dear friends, honors and delights the Lord. I thought about this lastly. Just some things God delights in. He delights in overcomers. Can I say, every one of us, if we want to take time, we could have some sad story to tell and blame something on somebody else why we're defective. Hmm? Huh? I'll start. I, I come from a broken home. My parents divorced when I was 13 years of age, and I, I was ruined the rest of my life for it. I mean, we can find something. Huh? Brother Don was born ugly. I mean, you know, we can find something. <laughs> We can always, always blame our situation on an event, on a circumstance, or on somebody else. It sure does make us feel good, but it doesn't help the situation. You know what causes the Lord to delight? When we recognize we are what we are by the grace of God. When we recognize that we're presented with an opportunity to either live for God or to wallow in our self-pity. And we choose to get out from underneath our juniper tree and go on and trust the Lord. He delights in those that overcome their circumstance or their situation. We all have them. I mean, every one of us can look back at something and say, boy, if this would have turned out different, boy, where would my life be? Hmm? Huh? You know, Miss Lisa talked about the devil being, I don't know why I'm picking on you. You're the one testified, but you know. You know, every now and then the devil get on my back. Hmm? It was one sunny afternoon in May of 1981 when I should have been playing shortstop. I was thrown into pitching. I shouldn't have pitched. I'd already pitched three times that week. But me, Mr. Egomaniac, who grew up watching Pedro Bourbon, who could throw eight pitches, and he had a rubber arm, and he was ready to go. The one, the first time he walked in the Astrodome, looked up, threw a baseball, and hit the roof of it. Nobody else had ever done that. I thought I was Pedro Bourbon. I said, well, I'll go pitch. Bless God. And against Todd Benzinger, who went on to play for the Reds, catch the last out of the 1990 World Series on that sunny afternoon, the second pitch I threw to him, my shoulder went click that was back before they did Tommy John surgery that hadn't been invented for another six years and that was it something I had aspired to and had worked after and looked forward to for most of my life was over Miss Lynn will tell you I was a baseball playing nut my senior year, I hit 479 as the number one hitting shortstop in the state of Ohio. To put that in perspective, Barry Larkin, who's in the Hall of Fame, only hit 429. Was I as good as Larkin? No, but I like to brag that I out hit him. <laughs> truth is truth. But the bottom line was, I found out the Reds were looking at me to take me in the first round, and if they didn't take me, Kansas City was going to take me. A year later, a scout from Kansas City contacted me, asked how my shoulder was. Wanted to know if I could play because they was looking to take me in that year in the draft. And every now and then, the mind will go back 40 years. 41, really. What if? Especially when you find out there are guys sitting on the bench making four and a half million today on the bench. 
You know, we was talking at lunch about the Reds let a guy go. He'd been making ten million, you know, which is a bargain for a frontline pitcher through a no hitter this year. They just let him go for nothing. Uh, and Miss Annette says, Do they really make that much? I'm thinking he's they make it twenty five and thirty million if they can throw it over the plate. Huh? She passed out in the kitchen. We had to wait and revive her to have dinner. <laughs> then she smacked me. Why'd you mess your shoulder up? See, if you're not careful, you'll go back. And you'll think, what if? Now, in reality, God knew if I got messed up in that minor league baseball, I'd never been fit to be used by Him. Are you listening? And can, can I say what I'm doing tonight is far greater than anything any athlete has ever done in the history of athletics. Are you listening? If they called and asked me they wanted me to sit in the Oval Office and take over in Washington, D.C., that'd be a step down from being a man of God. Are you listening? Hmm. When you overcome the situations you've been dealt in your life and you live for Jesus, God delights in that. Matter of fact, he said this in Revelation chapter number 3. In verse number 12, he says, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. Uh, and I will write upon him my new name. Uh, hey, I'd rather be known by him and have his name on me and his hand on me uh, and his uh, uh, presence on me uh, uh, than anything this world has to offer. He went on to write this in verse 21 of Revelation 3. To him that overcometh, Will I grant to sit with me in my throne, uh, even as I also overcame and have sat down with my Father in His throne? He delights in overcomers. So much he says, you overcome, I'll let you come sit in my throne. I don't know about you. She sang that verse. She never got to walk the halls of fame. If you're an overcomer, listen to me. You'll be sitting with him in his throne. Can you imagine all the host of heaven? Read Revelation chapter 5. People from every nation, tongue, and kindred, uh, uh, the multitude of the heavenly hosts, uh, all around the throne crying, Holy, holy, holy unto the Lamb. Uh, all of them saying, Worthy is the Lamb. Uh, uh, they're all there in glory, giving God the glory. And then they look up and say, Who's that sitting with the Lord? Could be you if you're an overcomer. Because he delights in overcomers. I'll just give you a few things tonight that he delights in. I've got one question for you. Does he delight in you? See, Brother Jim, it doesn't really matter in your situation if he delights in me. Does he delight in you? Because hmm? I'd rather have his blessings and his touch on me. I want him pleased with me. Does he delight in you? If so, you ought to say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. But if not, let me ask you a good question. Why not? You work so hard at everything else in this world. Why don't you work hard at letting God be pleased with you? Hmm? Say, how do I do that, preacher? Just mind the Lord. Just do what He tells you to do. I wonder, does He delight in you? You see, one of these days, we're all going to stand before Him and give an account of ourselves before Him. Will he be delighted to see you? That ought to be our goal as believers. I want the Lord to be pleased. I preached a message one time. As the Bible says that those that enter in and enter in faithfully, he says, enter into the joy of the Lord, thou good and faithful servant. He says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I preached a message one time on well done or done for. I'd sure rather get a well done than done for, wouldn't you? Does he delight in you? Is he pleased with you? He can be. If he's not, why don't you start and purpose in your heart from this day forward? You're going to serve the Lord so he'll be pleased and delight in your life. Huh? You ever see a grandparent pull out them pictures of them grandbabies? You don't have to understand they're delighting in them grandbabies. I wonder if God shows you all. You do realize it was God that brought Job up to the devil. God was the one showing off Job. Are you listening? Because he delighted in Job. I wonder if he delights in us.
Oh, I want to please him. Maybe you're here tonight, you don't know him. You can, don't we? He loves you. He died for you, made a way for you to be saved so he can delight in your life. All you got to do is put your faith and trust in him. Moment, we're going to give an invitation. We invite you to come. If you don't know the Lord, we'll get somebody to take a Bible, show you how to be saved. You can be saved tonight. But if you know the Lord, are you pleasing him? That ought to be at the forefront of our minds. Am I pleasing the Lord? You know what would be great for this revival season we're getting ready to have? We all make up our mind. We're going to let the Lord be delighted in our lives. Hmm? And that starts tonight. Is he delighted in you? Let's all stand. Brother Ray, come get a song of invitation. While they're coming, picking out a song, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you for the scriptures. Lord, one of the greatest dangers is not learning from history. Lord, America certainly isn't learning from history. Israel didn't learn from history. But as God's people, we ought to learn from history and realize you, you are very, very, very concerned about your word. And you have magnified your word above your name. And God, help us as your people to strive to live a life that you'll be delighted with. Help us to become overcomers. Help us to be obedient. Help us, Lord, to be on the up and up. Help us to be folks that you look to that are upright and making a difference in this world. You know, God, I pray you'd bless this invitation. Speak to hearts. There's somebody here that, Lord, you're not pleased with something in their life. Show them so they can get that made right. Then, God, I pray the crowd decides if there's somebody that's not saved, tonight would be the night of their salvation. God, just speak to hearts here, and God, get glory. And God, help us, Lord, to please you and to impact our world during this day and age we live. Bless now in this invitation. Well, thank you for what you do, for it's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.